Hello, and welcome to the Drexel Interview. I'm your host, Paula Morantz Cohen, speaking to you from the Office of the President at Drexel University in Philadelphia. Today, my guest is John Fry, the 14th president of Drexel University. Drexel is a comprehensive research university with a long-standing cooperative education program. It was founded in 1891 and is located in West Philadelphia. John Fry came to Drexel in 2010 after spending eight years as president of Franklin and Marshall College in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, and seven years prior to that as executive vice president of the University of Pennsylvania, Drexel's neighbor in West Philadelphia. During his tenure at Franklin and Marshall and at Penn, President Fry was responsible for important changes, including the physical transformation of these university campuses. He has been doing the same at Drexel on a grander scale, providing a template for how an urban university can deal imaginatively and responsibly with its community and its city. John Fry, welcome to the Drexel Thanks, interview. Thanks, Paula. Good to be with you. If there was a phrase to characterize your leadership at the various institutions where you have been, it is civic engagement. Your belief, it appears to me, that you feel that universities should engage with their communities in a responsible and an educationally important way. Can you explain to us a little bit what, why this is so important, what you, how you understand this notion of civic engagement? I think I understand it um, first and foremost from a mission standpoint. So um, institutions like Drexel have very powerful research missions. We have very powerful educational missions. And then when we talk about service, it always feels like the sort of weak third leg on the stool. Maybe it's service you know, uh, on committees or other things like that. And I've always been struck that, that um, wouldn't we want to have service be just as robust as research and teaching. And so in my mind, civic engagement really should be the third and equally as powerful a leg on the university you know, mission stool, if you will. And civic engagement um, is important, I think, therefore, in bringing balance to the mission to make sure that as we're looking inward and we're creating knowledge and we're transmitting that knowledge, we're also thinking about how this impacts our local community and all the concentric circles around that. The second thing is that I think that students learn best when they learn by example. The theory in the classroom and the laboratory, yes, but also the practice. And I think that if they spend four more years at an institution that is deeply committed to civic engagement, that is in fact itself a great civic actor, I think that will inspire them in their lives as they go off and do whatever that they're going to do professionally or in their communities, that they remember that the institution that they call alma mater was a very, very powerful player on the larger civic stage. And I think that it, it provides opportunities for them to engage directly in that. I think it also provides them a little bit of inspiration. I can say that I have actually seen the results of that over the time that you've been the president. The students seem to me to be more engaged in that way. And I want to get back to that. But for now, I'd like to talk more specifically about some of the initiatives that are underway at the camp, on the campus. One of these is um, the so-called Promise Zone that Drexel's involved with, with Palton Village or Palton and Mantua neighborhoods, which are adjacent to Drexel. This area is one of the, one of the first five Promise Zones yes. that were identified in this yeah. country by the government, um, by the federal government, and that I believe you were involved in winning that designation. Yes. Could you explain to us what is a Promise Zone and why did these neighborhoods get designated as part of one. So as you mentioned, there's only five um, mm -hmm. which were designated by President Obama as promise zones and only three in cities. And so this was a real opportunity for us, along with a few other cities, to define what, what this whole promise zone concept will mean. And right now, it is at um, still at a conceptual level. So basically, it is a, a large area that includes neighborhoods mm -hmm. and institutions. In fact, the Drexel campus is encompassed within you know, the, the, the Promise Zone itself, which is a much larger area that reaches out over Palton Village and uh, over much of Mantua. And so we got together with um, the city of Philadelphia, 
under Michael Nutter's leadership and a number of other very important local uh, civic organizations, the People's Emergency Center, Mount Vernon Manor, other organizations that are usually not necessarily um, you know, connected and we started to connect all of those organizations and our university I think served as a bit of an anchor for this effort and over the last two years we made our application to the federal government and we were successful. So what does this mean? The first thing has already started which is everyone is talking to one another which is an enormously important thing when you think about how to make neighborhoods stronger. Um, it, it is not our institution doing something to the neighborhood to make it better. It is all of our collective neighborhoods and institutions acting in concert, each learning from one another. And I think just the very fact of submitting the application started to build relationships that hadn't been built before. The second is that there's going to be some sort of tax incentives for um, business development and for real estate development sort of to be determined in their specifics. Um, the third thing is, is that there's going to be points when you submit one of these large complex federal grants, which could be 10, 20, 30 million dollars or above, we go in having certain numbers of points that have already been achieved by the very fact that we're designated as a, a promise zone. And I think there are going to be many other features that are going to be very conducive to businesses wanting to establish um, their, their organizations here um, in this promise zone, which of course should redound to the benefit of all of us, but especially the local neighborhoods where there's a great deal of underemployment, uh, there's a, a paucity of, of high quality you know, public education. Uh, there are all sorts of, of other needs uh, related to public safety and affordable housing and things of that nature. And so the Promise Zone is really meant to, I guess, uh, approach this as a, a sort of holistic quality of life um, uh, initiative and ask how do we get jobs, better schools, uh, better um, opportunities for affordable housing, a great public environment and public safety that guarantees that. And how do we do that as a collective as opposed to little islands, whether it's a university island or a neighborhood island? You mentioned education in particular, which of course is our mission, yes. in, in as, especially so. And I know that one of, one of the most exciting developments is the, um, I wouldn't say it's an alliance between University City High School, which is in the the Mantua neighborhood um, that has been acquired by Drexel in partnership with the Wexford Science and Technology School. Right. Mm -hmm. That sounds to me a, a wonderful opportunity for, we have an education school here, yes. to do things uh, together that could really have an impact on this community that needs help. Could you talk a little bit about sure. the school? Well, on that site that we just purchased with Wexford from uh, the, the school district of Philadelphia, um, sits two failed schools, the University City High School, which closed actually a year ago, mm -hmm. and the Drew School, which closed about three years ago. And so, you know, here is this very visible site, um, well located, surrounded by very successful um, institutions, and we have two failed public schools in the middle of it. And so when this site became available for purchase, we asked ourselves at the university, well, what would be our use? We have plenty of space for academic expansion um, in the, you know, the area sort of east of where we are, sitting around 30th Street Station. So we didn't need that site for Drexel's expansion. What we wanted was a site that was well located for a neighborhood STEM-based uh, public school. And so we bid on the site with our partners from Wexford. We were the successful bidders. And we will start the process, hopefully, of developing um, a, a neighborhood sort of catchment area based STEM school. I'm very excited by the partnerships that Drexel has established in order to do that. The Science Leadership Academy will actually run the school. Um, the, um, the Franklin Institute will be a partner. The Academy of Natural Sciences of Drexel University will be a partner. We're hopeful the Philadelphia Zoo will be a partner. Talk about a hyper enriched environment for you know, children you know, K through eight. Um, from the various neighborhoods in West Palton and Palton Village, maybe even a part of Mantua. And having been involved in the, in the formation of the Penn Alexander School, which is immediately west of Penn's campus, it just um, it proves to me that public education actually can work in Philadelphia. But sometimes what you need are uh, broad shoulders um, working together. And I think our institution you know, provides part of that, as do the other institutions. And so, Paul, I think we're a couple of years away from actually knowing how this is going to work and how it's going to be funded. On the other hand, the purchase of the site enables us to locate it in a perfect place. 
wonderful concept. I'm sure other cities are going to be watching this with a great deal of interest. Um, another area of partnership, perhaps even more intense, is underway. And uh, you're part of the leadership of this um, so-called innovation neighborhood, which is near 30th Street Station in Philadelphia. It's a 12-acre site um, that Drexel has acquired and is working to develop. And first, before we talk about what's going to go there, why do you call it the innovation neighborhood? It, it seems to me that in Philadelphia in general and in University City in particular, we've never quite figured out how to aggregate the incredible intellectual assets that we enjoy. And so we have you know, great universities like Drexel, like Penn, um, the first um, urban research park in the United States, the University Science Center, founded over 50 years ago. Incredible healthcare organizations like the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, the Hospital of the University of Pennsylvania, Presbyterian Hospital. And all those are you know, important, powerful organizations. Collectively, we receive well over a billion dollars of NIH and NSF funding, and yet we're all sort of separate in our own way. And the idea behind the innovation neighborhood um, is, is can we aggregate all of that incredible talent and all of those intellectual assets and focus them uh, in a place that's a special place next to the third busiest train station in the United States, located between New York and Washington, two of the most important cities in the world, uh, and in the fifth largest city uh, in the country, Philadelphia. It just seems that that amount of land next to that train station in this kind of city with these kind of intellectual assets gives us an opportunity to build an ecosystem here dedicated to innovation unlike many in the United States. We have, we have some examples. We have Palo Alto anchored by Stanford. We have uh, Cambridge anchored by MIT and Harvard. And if you go to those places, they are unbelievable in terms of the production um, and, and transmission of knowledge and the formation of, of, of companies and the historic economic development that they've created well beyond their regions. We think Philadelphia is capable of that. We just haven't put it together. So the real point of the innovation neighborhood is, is, to, is, to, is to try to aggregate all of this. So yes, it's an extension of Drexel's campus, but it's so much more than that. Mm -hmm. You spoke about partnerships, and I'd, I'd like you to discuss a bit the partnerships involved in what's going to what's projected for the innovation neighborhood. Um, as I understand it, uh, this is happening, this will happen on many, of many kinds of partnerships and on many levels. First of all, development. Developers, then government agencies, and other universities. Let's talk about developers first. Sure. What will be their role in this program, this project? So there are about 10 sites within this 12-acre area that we've assembled immediately west of 30th Street Station. I have to say that, that we started this assemblage in 1993 when the trustees of Drexel University made the very brave decision to uh, acquire the old bulletin building headquarters and printing plant. That was a time in Drexel's history that was a difficult one financially, and the trustees, I think, had the courage of their convictions and also an eye towards the future. We've since made decisions post-1993 to add to those sites. And so 12 acres yields um, 10 sites, which yield over 6 million square feet of potential development. And so our view is that we're not you know, real estate developers. What we try to do is make sure our footprint um, is, is um, uh, uh, coherent and big enough for us to grow. And so we've acquired all this land. But our hope is, is to partner with uh, what they would call a master developer to help us over about a 20-year period to develop each one of those 10 sites. So the idea behind it is that each of these sites would have um, some sort of Drexel academic program um, in each of them. Because it would be very nice, as someone is building a significant building for Drexel, to say, give us three floors or five floors for our College of Computing and Informatics or for the College of Arts and Sciences or for the new School of Education. So in a way, we don't have to put our capital to work on, on physical projects. We can put it to work on the things that we do best here, which are teaching research and civic engagement. The ideal partnership is that we have a long-term relationship with a single developer that develops each of those sites, and we have sort of the first right of refusal for some of that space. And then based on what we need, everything else is sort of developed according to what the market needs. And here, there's a very important connection between Drexel and the market, because as a cooperative education 
based institution, we can't do our work, we can't fulfill our mission without these partnerships. And so I'm hoping that what happens are like-minded institutions, commercial, healthcare, maybe even other universities come in, occupy the space, and that gives us an opportunity for our cooperative education program to partner with those organizations, or for our faculty to partner with them on all sorts of you know, um, basic and translational research opportunities. So there are many levels of partnership many, many going levels. on here. That's really exciting. Right. And then partnership yeah. is, a, is really a core part of, 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 of how we do our work. It's the fact that you have to deal with agencies, local, uh, state, federal, is that a challenge? The government has actually been an, an enabler for really? us, and I think it's because we've cultivated <laughs> very good relationships um, with um, Mayor Nutter. Um, he has some wonderful people working you know, with him, Alan Greenberger, John Grady from PIDC. They understand and get what we're trying to do. So as a result, our interactions with um, the city and, and city council, of course, Jenny Blackwell, are very easy and smooth because I think we all have the same goal. What we're trying to do is grow this area economically and also make it a great place you know, to live beyond just being a great place to work. And so honestly, the government uh, colleagues that we've had have been really enabling us along the way to do what we need to do. In addition, we have quasi-government organizations like Amtrak and SEPTA that we're also working with on thinking about the future of the, the, the rail yard development, which would be sort of well down the road. And again, I think we are all very like-minded. We want to figure out how do we monetize the assets that we have and then put those assets to work in a way that's economically advantageous for everyone. And by the way, not just the people who would work um, or live in the innovation neighborhood, but the surrounding neighborhoods in Mantua and in Palton and in West Palton. So it spills over into the promise zone, the innovation neighborhood. And that's, you yeah. know, if there's a big idea the here is here. You know, how do yeah. you connect this idea of an innovation you know, neighborhood with the promise and the opportunity uh, embedded in this promise zone designation so that the two are not separate. In fact, they become completely joined. Finally, you mentioned universities. I think it's interesting that there's some sense that perhaps other universities, either local or uh, international, would be involved in this innovation neighborhood. And I wonder about that. How do you rationalize bringing together other universities who are our competitors uh, in a, a, such an economically difficult time that we're in where everyone is competing against everyone else. How do you see the relationship among the many universities in Philadelphia and maybe beyond in terms of the development of the area? You know, I think there, I mean, to some degree, maybe there's some competition, but there's more to gain through mm -hmm. collaboration. There are, are things that we do very well that perhaps Penn and Temple don't do and vice versa. And why not think about aggregating them instead of keeping them separate because they're, you know, quote, competitive. And uh, I also think about great universities like Hebrew University in Jerusalem where we're working on a, a very large set of, of, of projects which include, by the way, the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. I could see maybe one um, use of, of this innovation neighborhood to be a three-way, um, you know, partnership uh, among our institutions that might yield you know, all sorts of research opportunities and maybe commercial opportunities. Why wouldn't that want to be in the innovation neighborhood? You know, we have our friends from, from Israel. We're there on a regular basis. They're here on a regular basis. Why not memorialize this place as the place that we actually meet and work together? Well, to carry on this theme, and I do see that everything sort of connects together in your vision for Drexel and for Philadelphia and beyond, perhaps, Drexel under your leadership has become more physically penetrated by the city um, in ways. It's become, I think, a more of a university that you feel the city being part of. It has a, it has a quality of vitality about it, uh, very different from Penn, where you were before, which is a little bit more closed off. Um, and that, but that seems to connect with the ideas of those great Philadelphia architects, Robert Venturi and Denise Scott Brown, whom I know you know. Um, I, was their, I was their client. At you the, were their client when you were at the University of Pennsylvania. Yes. They were extraordinary in understanding how institutions and their contexts work together. And I wonder if you talk a little bit about how their ideas have influenced maybe the way you saw Drexel when you came here, how you envisioned you would develop it as a, as a university, as a campus. 
Let's put it that way. Well, these are these are thoughts and and ideas I've had starting from our time at Penn when I experienced Penn too much as an island, and and I went and started to get to know our neighbors and realize that they were so separate from us, and realized that probably the only people we were really cheating here were the students who felt like there were somehow barriers between campus and and community. And I would submit the best experiences when you can have both campus and community, not to have to choose one or the other. The fact is we're an urban university. Anthony J. Drexel picked this spot specifically because we were a block and a half from a, a train station and in the middle of a, a growing, developing industrial city at that point of time. So why not celebrate the, um, the, the sort of urban nature of our campus by making sure that we are not walled off from it, but in fact, we are completely integrated together. I'm one of those people who believes that um, the worst metaphor you can have for an educational institution is an ivory tower. Um, th th there should be a, a, a complete integration of, of campus and community. And that doesn't mean we can't have our memorable campus spaces uh, here at Drexel. It just means we want to share them with everyone. I am struck by the uh, emergence of so many areas where one can sit and talk now on the campus, which didn't exist before. To me, as a teacher, this is vital to education. And what I see is these little, you know, the Greek term is agoras, where, you know, meeting places for students and students and faculty where they can sit and eat. Eating is very important. There's a lot more food and good places to eat. This is, I mean, are, were you thinking in those terms? I mean, this is for the community as well, Absolutely. but also for the students to sit together there. If you walk through our campus now, you see them sitting and talking. That's the greatest uh, sales ploy that there is for a university. You see students sitting and talking. Right. Was this part of your vision when you, when you began developing Absolutely. the campus? Well, so I refer to this as the, 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 the sort of uh, way space facilitates the serendipitous moments. And so, mm -hmm. You know, you're a student and you're, you're, you're having a cup of coffee in a local coffee house or sitting out on a bench and your, you know, your professor comes by. And, you know, what, what started as a, a, a quick hello turns into a 45-minute a chat. I mean, that's, those serendipitous moments are what places like this are all about. And, of course, that could be faculty to faculty member, which leads to a collaboration that may not, otherwise not have occurred. And so Drexel's a very busy, you know, sort of buzzing place. People are running to and fro. I, I'd like to slow the pace down a little bit. I'd like to give uh, our students and our faculty and our staff and our neighbors as many memorable spaces with the excuse of allowing them to sort of bump into each other when they might normally be just trying to go from place to place. And so that's definitely part of the strategy. And I think it creates a happier um, and uh, more engaged campus when people have places that they like to go and just hang out. And, and good things can happen when they're hanging out. Well, the hanging out is connected also to the spaces themselves and the buildings, which you've been very into. I mean, architecture seems to be one of your passions. And we certainly have seen the creation of many new buildings at Drexel, designed by important architects, most notably Robert A. M. Stern, who did the new LeBeau business building and the uh, retail space. Chestnut Square. Chestnut right. Square. I should note also the Urban Center, which is extraordinary, was originally designed by Robert Venturi mm -hmm. and then renovated by another architectural firm. And then, of course, the Innovation Neighborhood will bring in a major architectural firm. What is this about architecture? Are you, what, what role do you see great architects playing in the development of a university campus? I know that's a controversial idea. Should there be important architecture on a campus because it's expensive? Mm -hmm. or not. I think I'm less concerned about the brand and more concerned about um, the way in which you know a good architect can understand the interactions on a campus like ours, a campus devoted to, again, the creation and transmission of knowledge, and then think about how to develop a comfortable and memorable place for that to occur, where also people feel important. When you walk into these new buildings, among other things, you feel important because it's a great space. Someone really thought about it and labored over it and talked to a lot of people when they put together the program. And so if you go into Urban or if you go into LeBeau or many other spaces that we've, we've created, the Papadakis Integrated Sciences Building, I think people's reaction is not only are these beautiful spaces, but someone really cares about me and they care about my colleagues because they've taken enough time and, and effort and made enough investment to create a place that we want to be. And then when you're in an environment that a great architect has 
provided uh, where you, you feel you want to be, you're going to spend more time there. You're going to have you know, richer opportunities to do the kind of creative work that we want our faculty and students you know, to do. And I think that um, with the right kind of breakout spaces and collaborative spaces, you're also going to do that in a team-based way. And so I don't think it's a matter of just throwing up a bunch of space because there are fancy architects and you want to have you know, their names and lights. I think it's actually what you want to do is, is go for the kind of talent that understands that at the heart of this enterprise is the magic moments that occur between faculty and students. And we want to do everything we can to make sure that the, the places we have are conducive to those interactions between faculty and students. That's, that's the true name of the game here. Yes, and I can say that uh, because we're out of time now that there have been a lot more of those moments. And there'll I be think. a lot more in the future, hopefully. Yeah. Well, I want to thank you, John Fry, My for pleasure, being here Paul. today. Good to be with you. And thank you for joining us today at the Drexel interview.